Hi, I'm Dr. Johnson Haas, and welcome to Earth Parts. Almost immediately after accretion is it's almost over, it's drawing to a close, after about 100 million years into this. Around 4.4 billion years ago, Earth was very much in a molten state, still being subject to impacts from incoming asteroidal material, cometary material. And so the Earth's primary original atmosphere would have been hydrogen, helium, and light volatiles boiled out from the interior, as I discussed in the previous module. And it's around this time that we think Earth was hit by something around the size of Mars, around the mass of the planet Mars. And today we call that object Theia. Now, before we got to the moon, before the Apollo astronauts landed on the moon, it wasn't at all clear what the origin of the moon was. And there were many competing alternate hypotheses, some of them more speculative than others. For example, maybe the moon and the Earth formed together during accretion. Maybe they simply formed as a sort of mini accretion disk within the larger one. We think that Jupiter formed this way, that Jupiter and its moons all formed as one mini accretion disk within the larger one, like a, an eddy whirlpool. So it's not unreasonable, but it doesn't quite match up. Earth and the moon are very different. They are compositionally different. The moon has no water. It has no atmosphere. It doesn't l look chemically like the Earth does. So if they form together, shouldn't it look more like us? Another idea, this was an early idea that was quickly discarded, was that perhaps when the Earth formed, it was spinning so quickly that it budded off the moon. It sort of splashed the moon out. But that doesn't work either, because if you try to work out the geophysics of that, as people have done, the Earth would simply splash apart. It would, fall, it would, it would fly apart. Another idea was that perhaps the moon was captured by Earth. And this isn't a crazy idea either. During accretion, and just at the last phases of accretion, there were lots of stray objects around, and maybe the moon got captured by Earth. It could be compositionally different and be captured by us, but that doesn't really work, because it's a large moon. It's, it's one of the largest moons relative to planet mass in our system, and so it's not easy to capture the moon. People who've looked at this come up with the answer that, no, it's actually a very narrow keyhole that would get you that kind of capture. It's very difficult to do. The moon would have to approach it just so, just the right angle, just the right speed, and that's asking for a lot. The thing is, none of these alternate hypotheses worked. The moon differs strongly in composition from the Earth. Uh, it doesn't seem like it could have formed simultaneously with the Earth, therefore. Earth would have broken apart if it was spinning fast enough to produce a moon, and the moon would be very difficult to capture. So that's not a very satisfactory explanation. What has emerged as the leading contender in the model for the moon's formation is called the giant impact hypothesis. The idea here is that Earth was hit by something about the size of Mars, and the resulting chaos essentially turned both Earth and Thea, the impactor, into a seething molten cloud of debris that recoalesced into the Earth, and a debris ring surrounding the Earth that itself coalesced into the moon. The result of the Thea impact would have vaporized the, the oceans, uh, even silicates, low temperature silicates in the crust of the Earth would have been vaporized. The, the Earth would have been turned into a seething molten mass. So I'm going to show you here a supercomputer simulation from a study where the authors did finite element calculations simulating Earth as a structured body with uh, surface crust, mantle, and core, and Thea similarly. And this is a model of a glancing impact. More recent work has suggested that the impact probably was more head-on than this shows because the blending of material seems to be very smooth. Earth's and the Moon's oxygen isotopes in the silicate rock that, that they're made of, the, the oxygen within the silicate, their oxygen isotope ratios shouldn't match if they're formed in different parts of the solar system, but they do match. They, they match exactly. And this is what you'd expect from chemically blending these two objects. So I'm going to proceed with this simulation. Now right off the bat here, you see that the impact has delved all the way into the, near the core of the Earth. So this is not a crater on the surface. This is a world-destroying event. Except the Earth is massive enough that it has enough gravity that most of that stuff is going to fall back to Earth. I'll proceed. Now you can see here that a big chunk of material 
representing the core of the impactor has fallen into the earth and merged with it. And there's a big splash of material all around that will form a debris ring. The light volatiles, meanwhile, that were surrounding the earth are all boiling into space. A lot of that will come back to earth because of earth's gravity, but the light volatiles in the debris ring itself are all gonna boil out of that stuff. And so the material that will accrete to make the moon is bone dry. It's lost all its volatiles. The Apollo astronauts found this out when they went up there. It's easy to see the debris ring forming here as the material orbits the Earth, although the simulation doesn't proceed far enough to watch the rubble piles around the Earth accrete. Now here's an interesting thing right here. What you just saw was a piece of debris, a big chunk of debris that came close enough to the Earth that it is being sheared apart in this long streamer material. That's because it's passed closer than what we call the Roche limit. The Roche limit is a critical distance from an object. If an object is, is orbiting another object, if it approaches within a critical distance, it will feel much greater gravitational pull on the near side facing its primary than its far side feels. The difference when you pass this Roche limit, the difference becomes large enough that it, that it becomes greater than the strength of the materials. Now eventually, the debris ring around the Earth is going to coalesce into a moon. Objects will either fall into the Earth and merge with its mass again, or they will remain in orbit and attractors within that ring will begin to pull that material together into a rubble pile, uh, forming uh, the moon eventually. So I'm going to proceed with this simulation without interruption. I want you to be able to look at the whole thing through and take it in. So what you're looking at here is a simulation I set up to try to extend the one you just saw. The one you just saw was from a research paper. This is more from a solar system game level simulation. It does a pretty good job, but um, what I'm doing here is setting up a situation that would be just after Thea's impact. Earth is being orbited by dozens of very small moons, which represent, in this model to me, represent fragments in the debris ring that are circling around the Earth. And I want to show what happens in that kind of situation. If you start with a lot of loose material, not a cloud, but a bunch of little moons, like you'd have after Thea's impact, what is eventually going to happen? So the orbital tracks of these objects are all sort of highlighted. You can see how they're moving. There's lots of little explosions going on. Those moons can all interact with each other. I'm letting the simulation proceed a long way here, years into after the impacts of all these moons. Notice things clean up significantly for now. And is, in fact, in this result, which I find is interesting, the Earth ends up orbited by a large moon close, close, much closer orbit than our moon. And then a smaller moon orbiting further out. And that little moon has its own little moon. So that's an interesting kind of cute result. Uh, it shows you, though, that you're going to get variations on a theme every time you do something like this. In the case of this simulation, it gave us a result very different from the Earth-Moon system. But it did give you a result where lots of loose debris coalesces or falls back to Earth and forms a small number of stably orbiting satellites. So I want to summarize what I've covered so far about the supporting evidence for the giant impact hypothesis. One, it was evident once the Apollo astronauts got up to the moon that the moon has no water or light volatiles in its surface regolith, the surface, uh, the powder covering the moon's rocks at the surface. There's no light volatiles at all. There's no atmosphere. There's no water frozen underground. And so this is explained by the giant impact forming a searing molten debris ring around the Earth coalesces over time to form a single dominant attracting attractor object, the moon. The moon also has a very small iron nickel core. It's, it's very unusual 
compared to what you'd expect geochemically for an object that size. The Earth, or say an asteroid that formed that, the size of the moon naturally, without it being the result of an impact, would have a much larger iron core, more similar to the proportions that Earth have. The moon's iron core is negligible. This is easily explained by the impact hypothesis because the core is the very thing that you'd expect to sink into our core because it's the densest, heaviest part of the impactor. Earth and the moon are isotopically nearly identical. As far as we can tell, we are identical, meaning the impact was probably not a glancing blow, but was a direct impact that turned the Earth into a cloud of debris, fell back to itself to form the, the planet, to reform the planet. And yet the debris ring is still there. It gathers everything up eventually. But in the process of Thea and Earth merging, mixing and blending, our basic chemical makeup, the isotope ratios of the oxygen in our silicate rocks are identical. They were blended that intimately during this process. So that's how violent it was.